Good morning. We welcome you to St. Stephen's United Methodist Church. We're thrilled that you could join us online. Uh, we have a wonderful service planned out today. It's a big service because we're going to be commissioning our youth uh, on their mission trip here in a little while. Just a few announcements I want to run down for you. Please take a look at your bulleted insert. Pay close attention uh, to what is in here. Uh, and also, I want to, know, want to let you know that we are still looking for people who want to be in our not in the choir choir. There we go. July 10th. It's going to start up. And if you have no musical ability and gifts, you are cut out perfectly for the not in the choir choir. And Marcy will give you all the tools you need. So uh, church offices will be closed on Thursday. And I uh, know that we have a new administrative assistant. Her name is Hillary Greer. She started earlier this week. If you haven't met her, we invite you to come by and introduce yourself. She's eager to get to know all of you. I will be on vacation uh, this week. I am going down to Texas with my family. I am, I know, Texas. Yeah, let's go for an outdoor vacation in Texas. So. But I am the middle child who has no power in the family. So let's be clear. Uh, Reverend Janice Sharp will be uh, preaching in my place. Uh, so make her feel welcome. And uh, please remember to fill out your registration books. Pass them to the person next to you. And did I forget anything? I'm looking at you, Alicia. Did I forget anything? We're good. All right, let us begin our morning worship.
You may be seated.
So we got some of the kids up here, but did you notice that there's other people joining us? What? Who are they? You don't have to say them by name, but... And each one, yeah. Are they a specific group? Who are they? They're the youth, yes. And you know what is not up here yet? Our, all of our youth sponsors need to be up here as well. So they all need to come forward because we're going to talk for a minute about what they're getting ready to do, okay? So we've got all of our youth sponsors up here, and some of you will need to help up at the end. <laughs> Not that I would ever point to who. <laughs> but we are thrilled about that they are coming. So I want to share a scripture with you, okay? And I want you to pay close attention to it. This is from Isaiah 58. And it's going to go like this. This is the kind of fast day I'm after to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, to free the oppressed, to cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering, ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this. The lights will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then, when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out and for help, and I'll say, here I am. So this comes from Isaiah, and but Isaiah is speaking on behalf of God. So I've got a question for you. Did you hear that first line? This is the kind of fast day I'm after. What do you think fast means, you all? Okay, what do you think? Like when you're like going super fast, like speeding. Yeah, so it's speeding. Yeah, Julia? When you don't eat Okay, yeah, when you don't eat meat or when you're not eating food at all. Yeah, Cassie? <coughs> okay. <laughs> what is the question? Yes, so what does a fast mean? I want to give you another definition, though. Fast often means what is it that God wants us to do? What is it that what do we seek to do? How do we seek to do it? So this is the kind of fast that he's talking about. He's saying, I don't want you to do these other things, but here's what I want you to do. And so I want us to talk for a minute about what it is in the Scripture God talks about wanting us to help others. So I want to ask you, how do you think you can help others in this church? Yeah, ask me. Giving them food and being kind to them. Giving them food and being kind. Yeah, that's one. Do we do that here? Yeah. Um, being welcoming to new people. Being welcoming to new people. That's very important. What's another way? Can you think of another way? Okay. Cassie? Helping people out when, when they feel sad. Helping people when they feel sad. That is outstanding because that's important. Sometimes we forget about that one, don't we? Yeah. And sometimes another way would be like we can help people who are homeless by giving them a home or, or welcoming them in sometimes. We can do all these things. And so, do you know if we do any of these here at St. Stephen's? Do you know any of them, Juliet? Yeah. What do we do? Can you think of one? Yes, the youth last week went to the Lazarus community. She's better than I am, y'all. I've not even thought of that one. So that is great. That's right. And they had a great time. But now I'm going to ask you, do you know what they're getting ready to do? Yeah, what? They're going to Colorado. They're going to Colorado. say that. Yeah, I know, I know. But your sister beat you too. And here's what's amazing is they're going to be doing the things that we're talking about. They're going to Denver as as you know, servants of this church to help other people who are homeless. But you know what? They represent you all. But here's what's interesting. Someday, all of you are going to be going on a trip, on a mission trip as well. And Alyssa will be taking you. <laughs> yeah, and Alyssa will be 62 at that time. <laughs> so, uh, so we are thrilled that they're going on our behalf. And so what I want us to do today is I want you all to be with them and pray with them as they go out. So what I'm going to do is ask that we all stand up, okay? 
Everybody back there as well. All right, we may have to surround the altar, so we're going to go around and, and take hands. So let's go around. Come on, woman. Oh yeah, okay, we need a bigger circle. Do why. This church is always making big circles. Oh, wait, oh, not. <laughs> All right. So what I want to do is I ask that everybody join in our commissioning service, and we're going to send them out in ministry. So if you would look at your uh, insert, all who take upon themselves the name of Christ, are called into ministries of love and service by the example of Christ. As those members of our community begin their work among the people of Denver, we pray the blessings of God and this community upon their endeavors. Let us join together. We recognize you as servants of this congregation in ministry with the people of Denver and dedicate you to service in the name of Jesus Christ. Through the prayers will be united May God richly bless your labors. Let us affirm our belief in the responsibilities of Christian service. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts. We commit ourselves to the rights and dignity of all persons and to the improvement of quality of life. We dedicate ourselves to peace throughout the world and to the rule of justice and law among all nations. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs and gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Now before we uh, take, before we let go of hands, I just want you to look at this group. I want the congregation to look at this group and understand that they are going out in ministry and in love. Now, one of the things that we do at this church that is so wonderful is, and we won't do it, but we're not going to do it now, but we are always drawing the circle wider. And that is one of the themes of this church. And one of the amazing things is our youth this week will represent us in drawing that circle wider to include the people of Denver. And so I really want to ask that you keep them in your prayers throughout this week, that they have a wonderful experience, and that they touch the hearts and souls of others, and that others feel the love of St. Stephen's in the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Kids, you can go where you're supposed to go. <laughs> Alyssa just reminded me that that's about half the youth who are going. <laughs> so she's got her work cut out for me. Yeah, I can turn it on. Hear these words from the New Testament, Revelation 21, 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. The word of life for today. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's funny when I chose this morning when uh, our 
uh, scripture reader was reading, uh, he had, kept having to clear his throat. Uh, it was sort of bothering him. And then I laughed and I said, anytime we read Revelations, we're clearing our throat. <laughs> uh, in this congregation, especially, there are always, always great uh, you know, intrepidation when you approach the book of Revelations. And I laughed because I know that I'm preaching from it today. And Greg only took 10, 10 years to deprogram me from it. So, you know, so we are working at looking at the book of Revelation just for a moment, because I want to say something. The book of Revelation is cryptic, hard to understand, is looked upon with great disdain, and most of that is warranted. But I want us to focus on the last two chapters, just for a moment, who give us a beautiful image of what the world can look like. Because I think sometimes we see the world as it is, and not what God sees the potential of the world to be. And so I want us to begin by talking about new community. And we've been doing that for quite some time. And we're doing our last sermon in our sermon series, Leaning into Love. And there's a statement that I want to share with you uh, from, uh, from Father uh, Greg Boyle. He's a Catholic uh, Jesuit. And he says, uh, he, he refers to the statement, no justice, no peace. Now we've all heard that, haven't we? And he says that he agrees with that, but he believes that there's actually something much larger uh, than that. And he says that he, he argues that true peace, if we are to achieve true peace, we must first discover kinship between us and others. No kinship, no peace. And I think what he's arguing about is that in order to achieve true peace with others, we must first create relationship. And it's interesting because I think sometimes when we talk about social justice, we get caught up so much in doing the work that we forget to pull back and actually enter into relationships. We can get caught up in the legalities of, of social justice. We can get caught up in the practice or in the process. And we forget about touching the hearts and souls of others. And what do I mean by the word kinship? And I want to talk about this. Kinship is the intricate web of relationships that is woven into the fabric of our lives. Now, many people would look at kinship, and you know, the common understanding is that that means family or blood relation. But from a theological perspective, it is such a larger word. It is the sharing of characteristics and origins as children of God. And we all share one origin. We are all created by the same creator. And today as we conclude our sermon series, we're going to look one last time at how we interact with others in the world and how we build relationships with others. And before we go any further, I want to talk about uh, one of our ministries here in this church. Because one of our ministries is already doing this so well. And that is our refugee, our Norman Coalition for Refugee Support. Because we would look very easily sometimes at our at social justice and say, well, all we need to do is meet their immediate needs. But if you work with Brent or if you work with our Norman Coalition, what you soon discover is that they are actually building relationships. Every refugee family that come here, while we meet their immediate needs and we try and help, they are also adopted by a different family within the community who form relationships, who bond together, who go to their events. Now, uh, she's not here yet today, but little Lyndon, if you look, Lyndon has a dress uh, that she's been wearing every Sunday, and it's adorable. It was made by the 16-year-old daughter of one of our Afghan families. That's about relationship. That's building relationships. And I want to share with you an experience uh, that happened to me many years ago while I was in seminary in Denver. I was working at Urban Peak, which is a homeless uh, youth shelter in Denver. Many of you know that story. And I want to tell you that while we were a secular institution, uh, we had a lot of different churches that came in and out of uh, the ministry, out of, the, uh, out of Urban Peak. They would come and they would serve dinner uh, to the youth. Now, because we we're a secular institution and we wanted to be understanding and inclusive of all different types of religious views, we never did a prayer. But on this particular night, a church came 
uh, that I was unfamiliar with, didn't know who they were, they were new, and they came to bring the meal in, and I had to step out and do an intake with one of our other students, or one, one of our youth. And while I was doing that, suddenly the gentleman in front of the church began a prayer. And I was like, and I was about to rush in to stop, and I thought, I'll let him go. We'll just get it over with. That doesn't sound like we're preaching. <laughs> just get it over with. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because as he prayed, he kept saying, thank you, Jesus, for this. And thank you, Jesus, for that. And thank you, Jesus, for this. And that, and this, and that, and this, and that. And it went on, and on, and on. All these thank you, Jesus, until one of the youth uh, responded very loudly by proclaiming, Yeah, Jesus, thanks for making me believe in homeless. And the prayer came to an abrupt end, I can assure you. And this gentleman suddenly rushed out the door of a repeat to get into his car and leave. And he was good. And as, as he was leaving, he was uh, turning to my partner and I as we followed him to the car and lambasting us for not defending God. And then my shelter partner, Dan, proclaimed to the man, he said, <clears throat> Sir, can you think of one time in the Bible where Jesus walked out on someone in pain and suffering? The man paused for a moment, and then Dan stated, God is about entering into relationships, about bringing healing and hope to the broken. Now, I need to tell you something. I cannot remember the man's response, but I can tell you I remember Dan's. And it stuck with me my whole life that we are never to turn away from those who are broken. We are always called to build relationship. And that is what kinship is. Creating relationships of love and understanding by learning and growing with one another. Incredibly important. And yet the truth is, is that that's hard. It's hard for us to build relationships sometimes. We become overwhelmed by the multitude of relationships that already inundate our lives. How many of you would say that you've got all the friends you can handle. I'm the only one. Thank you, Rhett. You know? I know the rest of you are lying. You know, it's funny. I always laugh because I can say this. We have several preachers in the congregation. If you ever talk to a preacher and say, you want me to go do mission work? I'll go, oh, Because we've done it. We've spent our entire careers meeting people and growing, and sometimes we feel overwhelmed, and we don't want to start any new relationships. Because that's the easy way out. The truth is, is that sometimes we're not even aware of the relationships in our midst. I had an experience earlier this week that I don't want to go too deep into, but to say that I was with several people from this church and we were listening to another member tell their story. And it was incredible that all of us listening were saying to ourselves, I never knew that about this person. It's amazing that sometimes we do not even know one another as well as we think. Kinship is about far more than knowing one another, knowing their names. It is learning, hearing, growing together as one. And yet the great challenge before us is that too often, instead of entering into relationships, we begin to create barriers between us and others. And why? Because it's protection. If you can create a barrier between you and someone else, then that means I don't have to enter into a relationship with them. They're different from me, and now I can stay right here, sequestered in my community. Barriers that obstruct us from others, barriers based upon race, language, nationality, lifestyle, education, economic status, political leaning. And for everybody here in this room, you can add one more. Because we can come up with that many barriers in our relationships. Barriers that fracture humanity and separate us off. And we become us and them. We've always thought about that, haven't we? Don't take long. If you watch the news, you can see a clear distinction between us and them. It doesn't, it's not hard to find. 
And eventually we become those who not only separate ourselves off from others, but begin to see the them as those we must protect ourselves from, as those who we imagine are much different from our group. But Father Greg Boyle declares in this interview, he says, Jesus was only about dismantling the barriers that exclude. Jesus was only about expanding the circle of compassion, hoping no one would be standing outside of it. Us and them is the opposite of God. How do we obliterate the illusion that we are separate? And how do we get to a place where it's just us? There is no such thing as an enemy. Demonizing is always a lie, always an untruth. And yet it's hard because our nature is one of selfishness. It's ego-driven, focused on our own needs, our own wants and desires, placing ourselves in positions over and above others in importance. We begin to believe that God resembles not the us in the world, but the me. Now I need to tell you, when I'm angry, when I'm resentful, when I want things in life and others are in my way, do you know what God looks like? Let me describe God. When these things happen in my world, God suddenly becomes short. He's bald. He has glasses. He's slightly overweight and has a predisposition to incline him towards any pastry that's available in his presence. That is what I see as God when I am trying to avoid the world. But Boyle reminds us of that old saying, there is only one difference between myself and God, and that is that God never thinks he's me. <laughs> we must strive to break free from the illusion that God is like me, that God is a mere image of ourselves. When God, I love this saying, and we've all seen it on Facebook, when God has the same enemies as you, that is when you discover that you have created God in your own image. Have you ever noticed that? That anytime somebody says, this are the, these people are the enemy, all the characteristics of God look like them. And that's not the reality of God, because that creates a small, minuscule understanding of God. When we have the same enemies as God, then suddenly our understanding of God is so tiny, so small. And yet God is so much bigger. Now I'm going to suck up for a moment here because he's here. And I don't know if he remembers this, but I remember one time at camp, and I'll invite Craig to see if he can remember this. Uh, he was serving this church, I'm pretty sure. And we were at our youth camp, uh, at Canyon Camp, and Craig brought his telescope. And I actually told him, Craig, that when you, in the first service, that when you brought that telescope to your office that my dad you shared, that was only so you could spy on all of the other preachers from there. That's what they all said, so. But he brought his telescope to camp. Now, we weren't able to use it because it was daytime. But, Craig, you set us down in a circle, and you began to discuss the size of the universe. Do you remember this? And I'm going to get the measurements wrong, but I remember that Craig said if the earth is a pinhead in the middle of this room, then the solar system's boundaries are somewhere around El Reno, I think you said. Uh, you know, the, the galaxy is somewhere around Missouri, and the universe can't even can be contained within this planet or within, uh, you know, within our world. That's how big God is in creation. I was reading an article the other day that says that the largest planet ever discovered is ROXS 42BB, creative name. And that that has a mass roughly nine times that of Jupiter, with a radius of two and a half times greater. And if I'm not mistaken, Jupiter is 70 times the size of the Earth. Now, if you stop and think about that and ponder that, it lets you know how small we are and how incredible is the size of God. How immense is the universe in which we live. God is so much greater than us. God is greater than the finite ways in which we attempt to define God. God is great, is larger 
then uh, God is a love that is larger than us. God is a, a compassion that is greater than us, more merciful than us, more forgiving than us, a God that is infinite in love and compassion. Where are those barriers that we construct? They are ones that God is constantly removing. And we are called to reimagine community, to create kinship in the world, to build relationships. In the creating of a just world, we must do more than simply fight for justice. We must build relationships with the other, both friend and with foe. And building relationships with foe is so difficult. We, in the first service, we lifted up our nation and our state in prayers. And folks, that means that we've got to be able to love some of those who we don't agree with. And that's very hard at this time. But we're called to do it. We must listen to their stories, share their griefs, empathize with their pains, rejoice in their triumphs, and pray for their well-being. As I reflect today, I find it interesting that Jesus, in all the proclamations, doesn't ever say, open a homeless shelter, or build a food bank, or create a clothing closet. He says, break bread with those in need. Bring the homeless into your home and clothe the naked. Now, I want to say something. I'm not diminishing those ministries. They are so incredibly important and needed in our world. But if we forget to build relationships with those we're reaching out to, then you begin to wonder, what is it for? We are to reach out in love and to hear their stories. Jesus is saying something more to us. Saying something to us about creating relationships. Challenging us to take the time in addressing their physical needs to also address their spiritual needs. To move from the other to the us by hearing their stories. And I'll tell you what else. By being vulnerable enough to share our stories. Sometimes we don't want to tell our stories. But if we are going to ask them to trust us, we must trust them. This is when new community is created. And that is what we see in John's revelation in the last two chapters. Now, like I said, I could really pretty much do without those first 20 <laughs> chapters. Not a big deal to me. If I never read them again, I'd probably be okay. But at 21, they create a beautiful new image of community in the world. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the past had been washed away, and the barriers between us removed. And God dwelt among mortals. The world that humanity, humanity had created was a place where the spirit of love, compassion, forgiveness, mercy, and acceptance were the norms of human society. One in which God could find a home. Where grief and sorrow find no footing, and only joy prevails. This is the new understanding of community, one of kinship, one in which we must reimagine. Reimagine as the we, reimagine as the whole of creation. And when I say the whole of creation, I'm not talking about this room. I'm not talking about just humanity. I'm talking about the natural world and all that exists within it. As we lean into love, as we lean into the world, we must do so knowing that God is greater than us. And knowing that God is challenging us to construct the intricate web of societal relationships. Relationships based upon love and compassion. And this week as our youth go out, that's what they'll be doing. They'll be building relationships with others. I've often wondered what could, what could have been had that adult who so long ago walked out on a youth in pain at Urban Peak? What if instead he had turned around, embraced that youth, sat down with him and asked him about his journey, shared in his pains? What relationship might have been created were it not for that man's minuscule understanding of God? It's possible that both lives could have been transformed what might it look like for us to sit down 
Hear the stories that others share. Listen with a compassionate heart and an open mind. If we open our hearts and minds and souls to those on whom we define as the other, perhaps we will transform the world into the us. An us that one day can all gather at the river that flows from the throne of God. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. There's a song of love in my heart. Turn in your black hymnals to hymn 2141 and please stand if you're able as we sing.
I believe God is doing a new thing. Every minute of every day, God is at work around us and within us for the homeless, a place to live, for the hungry, a feast, for the thirsty, a cup of cold, clean water that runneth over, for the weary, rest, for the lonely, the friend, for the sick, healing, and wholeness. Here's what I believe. Every minute of every day, God is making all things new, giving and giving and giving again. And you are called, we are called to be a part of God's work of generosity. You are called to give, to surrender your time, your talent and treasure to this God work of making all things new. You are called to give. We are called to give. This morning, offering will now be given and received. Let's pray. Loving God. With this money, make a whole new world. With these gifts, help make real what your prophets declare. That mourning and crying and pain will be no more. With these people, help make a world where everyone is loved. A world where justice and compassion roll down like a mighty stream. A world where everyone has warm food, cool water, health care. A world where death is no more, where mourning and crying and pain are no more. Do it now, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the people of God said, Amen. Let us give and receive our offering together. stand if you're able.
loving God, we come to you today working and striving to draw the circle ever wider, striving to embrace all within the family of God. And we know that there are often times when we dispar disparage ourselves and we create barriers one from another. But God, you have called us to look upon others as family, as brothers and sisters in the family of God, in all of humanity. And so we ask that you help us to set aside distinctions, to see the commonalities between us, for us to reach across to those who are suffering with illness, with disease, and with loss. And we ask that you help us to embrace them as our family. And where there are those in our community who are nameless, faceless, those who we pass each and every day, help us to reach out to them with understanding. When we look upon those who live in the shadows of our community, who, su who suffer from homelessness and hunger, Help us to recognize that you have called us into a relationship with them, not just to meet their basic needs, but to hear their stories, to rejoice with them when they need rejoicing, and to grieve with them when they grieve. God, help us to reach out to them with love and with an open heart and an open, and open ears. And God, where there are those in this world who suffer from exploitation, from hatred, and from violence, we ask that you help us to reach out to the victims. Help us to reach out to them with love and compassion. But God, also give us the strength and the courage to reach out to those who create such violence in the world. Knowing that while they are our foes in many ways, they are also our family. Let us listen to their stories so that by our compassion, their hearts might be transformed. For your Son, Jesus Christ, reached out to each and every one of us in our time of grief and sorrow. Reached out to us and helped us create and pave a new way for a new life. You created this community and we give you thanks. And now we go out into the world in ministry to all as we pray together the prayer your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, All embracing love, in, among, and beyond us all, defy us when we invoke your name to serve our own ends. Open us and our world to the new life you are bringing and sustain us through our daily cares. Bring peace to our conflicts with you, with others, with ourselves and shine through our fears of failure and death. For our life together dwells always in the radiance of your power. Let it be. Amen. Let's stand if you're able and sing together in our brief hymnal, number 3180, as we part for the towns and cities.